We aren't talking enough about what it means to be failed by a government you chose. See, our power and our politics cannot be about a vote five years for five minutes. Coalitions are badly managed. That's the problem we have in South Africa. We didn't create a society and a political culture that made us ready for multi-party governments. I also think we need a Black Afri Forum. There's more power in getting one rand from a million people than a million rand from one person. What if I told you that the same conditions that particularly organizations and communities find them, found themselves in, in 1985, are still prevalent right now? Unfortunately, I think a lot of that is true. I think we're seeing an increasing sense of discontent in the country. Up to 26 protests a day happen in this country between 2022 and 2023. We know that our political leaders may as well be banned and in exile. They're not on the ground. They're not in touch with communities. They aren't giving any regard to the citizen and the voter. They are all distracted by themselves and their political games and who's gonna get the new position in the city of Joburg. We are on our own in ways that are very, very disturbing for a democracy. And we are also afraid of our government in ways that are very disturbing. I mean, we don't talk half enough about the fear that social activists have. Young people who are running soup kitchens who are worried that if they do too well and the, the community likes them too much, that a councillor is going to come and shut them down. Or the very real reality that Abathali Basim Jondolo have lost 24 activists in political hits. We aren't talking enough about what it means to be failed by a government you chose. You see, in 1985, it almost made sense for people to know that they're being failed by a government that they didn't choose. But what does it mean to be failed by a government that's supposed to be ours, that we did choose, that looks like us? And so while it's a grim way to think about it, I want us to think about it. I want us to think about whether the democratic promise is being delivered on or being betrayed. What's also important about 1985 is that it is two years after the forming of the UDF, the United Democratic Front. The UDF brought together people from different communities, sports clubs, um, people from street committees, people who were in society and had decided that if it's going to be, it's going to be up to us as the citizens, as the people of this country to get the democracy won. That when the politicians have been shut down, they can shut down that small group, but they can't shut down millions of us. And so the bringing together of over 500 organizations in 1983 formed a UDF that gave people a sense of organized hope, hope around a goal, hope around the idea that we can not only get to a democratic South Africa, but we can get to a moment where we actually take ownership of our future and our destiny. We can end up apartheid, is what they said to themselves. And so I wonder what we make of that in this day and age. In 2023, the UDF celebrated its 40 year anniversary and called for the spirit of the UDF. Now, we don't have a shortage of community activism in South Africa right now. We don't have a shortage of NGOs. We don't have a shortage of community organizers. We don't have a shortage of social movements. So why is it that every time we talk to each other, we say things like, we're not angry enough. We say things like, South Africans aren't organizing enough. I think we say it because the content of our civil society organizing has been depoliticized. And so we're organizing in South Africa, but we're organizing to meet our immediate needs. We're organizing to try and get a politician to show up so that 
a tap is fixed in a community. We're organizing to be able to debate certain issues. We're organizing to try and meet needs that are very immediate because we don't think that the political is a space in which we can all play. And so the things that we're not organizing for is how we build political power. And that's what made the UDF interesting and what made it successful is that you had a netball team organizing for political power. You had a street committee organizing for political power. You had a church community organizing for political power. But in South Africa now, if a civil society organization says, we're building political power, it's almost like they're saying something wrong. They're saying a swear word. We have demobilized ourselves politically as civil society. So I've been working in civil society for a long time, for over 20 years now, different versions thereof. And one of the things that has become a normal thing for us to say in civil society is that we are apolitical, not just nonpartisan, not just we don't support one party or the other, but we are apolitical. And the reason why we say that is because we don't want to offend politicians. And we don't want politicians to feel threatened by us, particularly incumbent politicians. We want to stay on the right side of funders. And for some reason, there's a funding conversation around, we don't want you to really have politics. But we have to have a conversation about why we think it's okay to be apolitical in a context of a democracy that gives us the people power. What is our power for if it's not to shape the political future and landscape of this country. See, our power and our politics cannot be about a vote five years for five minutes. It can't be about that. And it also can't be about humanitarian support. And it also can't be about us, you know, just fixing potholes. It has to be about this idea that democracy means we govern ourselves. We govern ourselves and we have the power to change that government whenever we choose. And until we take that seriously, we can never have the spirit of the UDF. Because what the UDF had was a civil society that came together and said, there are more of us who care about changing this country than they are of them the politicians who are in power and who are benefiting with the status quo. So as we stare down the barrel of the 2024 elections, is it not time that we consider a new UDF? That we consider a new UDF moment that says as society, as citizens, as communities, as voters, we don't just come to this election as customers of political parties who are gonna prance around and sell us dreams. We come in as political role players and we take on the role of choosing who governs, how they govern, who represents us, and what our role is in shaping the future. That's the conversation I think we're not having. So in this segment, I wanna talk about coalitions. So going into the 2024 election, we all know that the big buzz is the idea that the ANC is going to dip below 50% for the first time and that we have the risk of or the opportunity of, depending on which side of the divide you're on, of a coalition government at national level. Um, I think that the jury is still out on that because I think that opposition parties cannot take for granted that just because the ANC has you know, disillusioned so many voters, that that automatically means that opposition parties are going to get the benefit of those votes. In fact, what we've seen over the years is more and more voters deciding to stay away rather than voters deciding to show up and vote for opposition parties. And so if we're going to have the ANC dip below 50%, it's not just going to be because you know, voters decide to magically turn their attention to other parties. It is going to have to be because other opposition parties actually step up and give the voters something to vote for. 
Now, our history with coalition politics isn't great, at least at a narrative level. Um, but I want to say two things about coalitions before I talk about what I think is important for the 2024 elections and civil society when it comes to coalitions. The first thing is that coalitions are not the boogeyman. They're not the devil. They're not going to, you know, come and eat us in the night. In fact, it's an anomaly. It's a strange thing in a multi-party system to have one party be dominant for so many years. So in fact, it should have happened earlier if we had a more robust um, political landscape. If our options and the quality of our options were higher, it could have happened earlier. But it has already happened, as we know, at the local government level in more than 66 um, municipalities. We have seen that there are more and more people who are opting for smaller parties, the over 300 parties that exist, for independent candidates, and that has spread out the vote and created multi-party governments. A multi-party electoral system should produce multi-party governments. That's just the natural course of events. We don't have a first-past-the-post system, and so we should have expected it. What we didn't do is we didn't create a society and a political culture that made us ready for multi-party governments. And so now we're all scared and we all um, are concerned because we are afraid of you know, the unknown. But I want us to just put to bed this idea that coalitions are bad. Coalitions are badly managed. That's the problem we have in South Africa, both because our political culture is not set up for it, and we have this dominance of party bosses, but also because our legislative framework is not um, there for it. We don't have the laws that help us have healthy um, and functional um, coalitions like they do in other places in the world where they're more common. So that, that we can put to bed. The second part of coalitions that I really want us to think about is what do coalitions offer us in the way of democracy that having one dominant party doesn't offer us or a few dominant parties doesn't offer us? Um, coalitions offer us an opportunity for us as voters to have a lot more say and sway in terms of how things pan out. So for all its sins, um, the Joburg Council and its failings have made us very wary of coalitions. But the one lesson that the Joburg City Council and the fact that a party that got less than 1% of the vote has a mayor there, if there's one lesson that that taught me was that every vote counts. You know, in a first-past-the-post system, you know, in, in a race where the first person who gets the highest vote gets all of the seats, the votes that go to the other person or to the other people, all of those are discarded. In our system, every vote counts. And so the importance of voting is actually raised in the context of coalitions. And so national coalitions and provincial coalitions are new, and they will be new in 2024. But they do offer us the opportunity to think that every vote counts and we must make the most of that. So that brings me to the role of civil society given an era of more and more coalitions. And just to, to remind us also that coalitions have not failed everywhere in this country. So we can, we can put that to bed too. But what I think is absolutely necessary as we go into the 2024 elections and beyond is what I'd like to call a coalition of society. Now, we think about coalitions as politicians coming and making deals amongst each other. And of course, we've heard about the multi-charter party coalition group um, led by the DA, the IFP, and others, um, formerly known as the Moonshot Pact. And that's a real symptom of the kind of coalition politics we've seen in the country big party bosses coming together and making deals with each other, deciding who gets this position, who gets that position, all of that. And that's really not the most useful way for us to determine um, you know, coalitions. Coalitions should be about what the voter has said, what the voter wants, and what governance needs. And that's why I think it's important for politicians to realize that coalitions need to be a coalition not of political parties, but a coalition of society as a whole that gives voice and expression for the voter and for communities of people, even for people who don't vote, like children. We need all of society to be able to bear in and you know, lean into what governance should look like 
in a coalition context. And it's easier to do that in a coalition than it is to do it when one party is dominant. When one party is dominant, we all have to knock down on the door of that one party and they can say to us, you're not members, you don't get a say. In a multi-party environment, actually the doors of many parties should be open because the dynamics are always fluid and we need to be able to lean into that more. So the multi-party charter, for example, is going to host a coalition or a civil society engagement towards the end of November. And that idea actually came from the most unlikely place. It came from the Freedom Front Plus. Um, and the leader of the Freedom Front Plus, uh, actually not the leader, the deputy leader, Corne Mulder, gave this speech a few months ago where he spoke about the UDF in the same ways that I have and the need for a UDF. And he said that, well, you know, a coalition can't work unless you have civil society on board. And so Corneille Mulder understood the need for a new UDF. And so I think that's probably where the idea for the multi-party charter reaching out to civil society comes from. The question that civil society has to ask itself is how do we go to the table with politicians and engage? And how do we actually win those engagements when we're not the ones contesting power? I think these are very interesting opportunities and we can decide who we're willing to engage with and who we're not willing to engage with on ideological basis and other, otherwise. But there are a few things that civil society needs to be prepared to do. The first thing is we need to be prepared to engage politicians, especially before an election. We need to decide that we're going to have head to head, heart to heart conversations with politicians and not just with government. And I say that because in the civil society space, we often tell each other that, you know, we are here to hold government to account, not politicians. And I'd like us to, to change that going into the 2024 elections. If civil society is there to help the rest of, of citizens and voters in between elections engage with government, nothing stops us from doing that as we head into an election going with the voter to go and engage those politicians that want our votes, all of our votes, by the way. We must be ready for those conversations. I think for too long, um, we've all treated ourselves like consumers of politicians coming in, like car salesmen and selling us cars. And then we just ask questions as if we know nothing about cars. You know, um, we're not even looking at the actual details of their manifestos. We're not looking at anything substantive. We're just going based on those and actions we have and we're being reactive. And I think we need a proactive civil society, a proactive citizenry and a proactive voting population going into this election saying, we're gonna eyeball these politicians and we're going to tell them what we need from them in order to get our vote. So, a friend of mine um, from the US, his name is John Taylor, organizes um, in black communities, particularly around black men, and said to me that the way that they've done building black power towards elections in the US in the last few cycles is they've realized that the establishment politicians don't generally care about black communities. And so when they go and vote, they're not going to go and vote for their champion they're going to go and vote for their opponent. And so as civil society, I'm not asking all of us to pick a party and go and all vote for a party. But I am saying that we should decide how we're gonna engage so that if we're not choosing our champion, at least what we're doing is choosing our opponent. We're deciding who's a worthy opponent. We're deciding who's an opponent that we have leverage over. We're deciding who's an opponent who we can, you know, get to the table on particular issues. But we can't just go in and not have a conversation about what it is we want and what it will take to get our vote, as if we're not going to vote. We are going to vote, and we have to have a definite conversation about what we're leveraging that vote for. So we have to do that. The second thing we need to do is we need to build a coalition amongst voters outside of the politicians and the political parties. So what does that look like? Political parties know that the election is a group project. The election is about groups of people or about a number of voters voting for the same 
person or, or party, and that gets them over the line. We, as voters, think of elections as an individual experience. So I'm going to the polls by myself. I'm going to be in the booth by myself. It's an individual experience. And parties have enjoyed that. They've liked keeping us isolated. But if you think about voting as a group project, it changes the dynamics, especially because the numbers are in the favor of non-aligned voters, non-politically aligned voters. So the ANC is the biggest party in the country. If we assume their, their numbers are at about 1.4 million members, they have 1.4 million members that are their guaranteed votes, but they needed 10 million votes in 2019 to get 57% of the vote. At the same time, there are 14 million unregistered voters in this country. If that 14 million, the majority of whom are youth, by the way, all decided to come out and vote the same, and even if they decided they're going to vote for the tree party, the tree party would be in power. But voters are treating it like an individual exercise, which diminishes our power. I think as civil society, we need to hold space for voters to have conversations about their political power with each other, about forming voting caucuses, about forming voting um, coalitions, so that as the voter, we can decide we're going to use our power together in our vote and multiply our power to get better outcomes. I mean, politicians don't understand anything except numbers when it comes to elections. They really don't. You know, ideas are nice, but they really care about the vote and the number of votes. What would it look like if we said, as civil society, as social movements, as communities, here's 50,000 of us, and we are all asking for the end to hunger. We are all asking for youth unemployment to drop. We are all asking for a climate agenda. We represent a seat in parliament. If you want the seat in parliament, you are going to have to come for all 50,000 of us together. What would that do to the psyche of politicians if they realized that we're not just one voter at a time, but we hold actual power as voters to give them a seat or take a seat away? On the issues we care about, on the, on the, on the demands that we have, and on what we expect from them as representatives. We're not using our collective power enough, and I wish we would. The final part of a coalition of society is us coming up and showing up to this election, looking out to protect the integrity of the election. And we don't just assume that the ANC and the DA and all of these political parties are all going to do the right thing in, in good faith. In other parts of the continent, and I've been an election observer in Kenya before, and I know there's a lot of election observation work that happens in other parts of Africa. You have boots on the ground of citizens, of civil society organizations who are watching out and looking at the vote to make sure everybody behaves in the right ways as politicians. I really want us to see ourselves in that role as well going into this election. Let's start thinking about the way that we're going to make sure that it's not just politicians who are hovering around when vote counting is taking place. That it's not only politicians that are making sure the IEC does the right thing. But it is all of us as voters, as citizens, as civil society that protects the integrity of this election. One way or the other, we are going to be the ones who lose if this election is stolen or rigged or incompetently held. We must make sure that that happens in credible ways. And so a coalition of society, as you can tell, is much broader than who gets what seat in parliament. A coalition of society is about an active citizenry, active communities, active voters that are deciding to pool our power as opposed to just going into this election and hoping for the best. So in the next section, I want to talk about what it means to mobilize voters and do voter mobilization and what it will take to mobilize voters, what civil society will need to do, what you know, we as communities will need to do to have more active and engaged and mobilized voters. So I want to make a, a distinction 
um, around the question of voter education and voter mobilization. We talk a lot about voter education in the country, and especially when we ask why are young people not voting, um, you know, we, we know the stats. We know that there are about 40 million of us over the age of 18. We know that in 2021, only 12 million showed up to vote. And there's 26 million of us registered, but the, this, this 14 million cohort of mainly young people who are unregistered. And the question we ask is, would voter education bring those people in? And my answer is no. Not because I don't think voter education is important, but voter education, especially the way the IEC has done it over the years, is more about the voting process. It's about how to vote and where to vote and when to vote and how to register. And all of that is going to become very important in the 2024 elections. And there's definitely a conversation to be had about electoral reform and the fact that the way we vote is going to be substantively different. But voter education alone only works when somebody is already motivated to vote. And so the work is not voter education, especially for civil society. The work is voter mobilization. So what does it take to mobilize voters? What does it take for voters to actively be thinking about their choices? What does it take for voters to actually organize themselves to engage with politicians in the run up to the election? What does it take for voters to organize themselves to get to the voting booth? Because we all know the, the, the unspoken talk about election days that we go and bry and that people get up and they literally organize themselves to bry as opposed to vote, right? And so how do we start to change that? Again, education is not the, the thing that's gonna do it. But here's where I have a provocation. I've already said that I think we need a new UDF. I also think we need a black Afri forum. So let me explain. Got in a bit of flack for this, but hey, let's go. What AfriForum has managed to do in post-democratic South Africa is provide a space for citizens, voters, communities of people who have a very narrow interest to not only pull their power in terms of their collective ideas um, and their mobilizing of issues and their voice in society, but they've pulled resources. So I'm not sure what the fee is now because I'm not paying that much attention to AfriForum. But at some point, the fee to be part of AfriForum was 50 rand a month. And their base of supporters was about 300,000 people. Now that's a relatively big base given that only 8% of the population is white. And so even less of that population is Afrikaner white, which is the core target for an AfriForum. To get 300,000 people to every month take money out of their pockets and give it to a cause that will not only organize their interests, but be able to resource when they need to do some work, like litigate, that shows that you have a mobilized citizenry. That is the most active that you can get. Now, people have said to me, well, inequality in this country is racialized and black people just don't have the money. We don't have 50 rand a month when the majority of black people are unemployed in order to pool our resources for political ends. I just don't think that's true. What is the evidence I have for that? It's called Stockfells. We have the money to pool resources so that we are consumer ready for Christmas. And so the ShopRite can get our money for Christmas. Surely there are ways for us to pool even small resources to organize ourselves for political power. The ANC, the EFF, and the, I think the DA as well does it, have known this in terms of asking for membership fees, for example, in political parties. However, that system has kind of been taken over by corruption, where buying of membership has displaced people taking the 10 rand or 20 rand out of their pocket. But why is it so powerful to get somebody to take out 20 rand out of their pocket, even if they're living in poverty? Because if somebody's going to give you their 20 rand, they're going to give you their vote. It's that simple. It's almost been a, a self-fulfilling prophecy in the negative way 
for the ANC to start buying people's membership through, you know, some um, dodgy deals. Because it takes away that moment where somebody says, I'm willing to part with resources because I believe that this entity of collective power that we're building is actually going to have long-term gain for me. So I think that in, within the civil society space, we have to have a conversation about money. Within the political space, we have to have conversations about money. We all know that we are bemoaning all the time political funding. We're bemoaning civil society on the basis that we say, whoever pays the piper calls the tune. Whoever gives the money calls the tune. George Soros, Rupert, Oppenheimer's, Patrice. So we all fixated on these big donors and we're saying they're calling the tune. The reason why they get to call the tune is because we don't have any money that can push back on that. So I keep saying to people, civil society, political spaces. I personally, in terms of building political power, think there's more power in getting one rand from a million people than a million rand from one person. As building political power goes, yes, it's easier to get one million rand from one person, but it's much more powerful to get one rand from a million people when you're trying to build power to change a country. And I think as as black communities, as disenfranchised communities, as communities who want to take our power back in this country, we cannot sit around and say, okay, here's how we're going to build power. We're going to hold mass protests, but we can only hold this mass protest if this funder funds this proposal. That doesn't work. <laughs> in fact, in most cases, that's not how protest works, which is why we have so many more protests than we have any other kind of political action that's mass in this country. If we planned for elections the way we do for protests, we would spend much less time looking for big donors and much more time pooling our resources that we have. We would also act with a lot more urgency and not say this thing can't happen because no donor came forward. We have made ourselves subjects of big donors because we have not thought creatively about what we do with pooling small money. Small money is more important than big money in the context that we find ourselves in South Africa. Small black money is particularly important in this country. If we care about our children's futures, we're going to have to start investing in those futures from our own pockets, as opposed to waiting for somebody else to do it. And what that gives us is a few things that civil society in this country has had a problem with. Number one, it gives us autonomy. A lot of civil society has been held back and constrained because we have to wait for the donor to tell us that it's okay to do something. Or we have to wait for the political parties who disperse patronage to tell us it's okay to do something. If we had resources that we could match the big funders with, it gives us more autonomy. The second thing that it does is it gives us more creativity. It gives us more opportunities to innovate. We, we, we're not waiting for anyone's permission, which means we can do things differently that have never been done before. I think the most important thing it does is it makes us dependent on each other as communities of people. It makes us lean into each other. One of my favorite political concepts is solidarity. And this is my, my big call to especially the middle class, the black middle class of this country. Yes, I know that we, as the black middle class, are very precarious. We look better than we actually are in terms of our financial situations. We are one paycheck away, many of us, from being in poverty. We are having to pay it forward all the time in terms of holding up our families and our communities. And so I know we're already taxed and there's already a lot asked of us. But I, what I do want to ask is that we consider what radical solidarity looks like that goes beyond us using our resources for our own interests and those of our families and leaning into issues that don't actually affect us. Black business needs to have a serious conversation about this as well. 
Black elites have to have an even more serious conversation about this. We have gotten to a point where class is the new race. And we are, we are divided along class lines and we are not looking out for things that are outside of our class interests. The 2021 July riots were able to happen because poor and marginalized, economically disenfranchised people in this country knew that they are on their own and that there are other people who have resources and those people are not gonna be on their side anyway. A radical solidarity means that we have to say, outside of what affects me, I am going to lean into support and fund the ability for people who, who, whose problems I don't share to self-organize and to co-govern and to get the things that they need. Radical solidarity says, I'm not only going to care about, about an issue because it's load shedding and it affects all of us. I'm going to care about the issues that don't affect me and I'm gonna do something about it and I'm gonna resource the ability of people who are affected by that. We have left, as the black middle class, we have left fixing this country to the people who are most vulnerable, least resourced, and we have asked them to show up for themselves and for us on too many occasions. The least that we can do is show up for them as well, especially where it counts in terms of mobilization and resourcing. So some people have said to me, well, this isn't the 1980s, but if it were the 1980s, people didn't need money to mobilize. Um, that's untrue. <laughs> and the reason why I know it's untrue is because what the 1980s and people who were organizing in the 1980s had that we don't have is jobs. Even if they were menial jobs, demeaning jobs, underpaying jobs, there were more jobs. When the 1950 six or 59 women's march happened and those women were organizing they were organizing from their own pockets because they had jobs when we have 70 percent youth unemployment when we have 40 percent broad expanded unemployment most people don't have just expendable cash and so as much as i want people to take their one rands out of their pockets i also want people of more means to have a few less Magnum ice creams, a few less dinners, a few less nights out. We're gonna to have to make some sacrifices in terms of leisure living, and we're gonna to have to invest into change. So I'm gonna end this by saying two, two things. And two things that I want civil society and communities um, and people who are not in the political domain just to consider as the two calls to action. A Palestinian activist friend of mine earlier in this year said to me that what they've learned from the Palestine struggle over the years is that no real reform can happen without a viable threat of revolution. No real reform can happen without a viable threat of revolution. And revolution is about mass organizing and change, whichever form it takes. And so I personally do not want us to have to go into revolution to fix South Africa. I think the longer that this crisis develops, the more revolution and just revolt is possible. But I do think we need to build power so there's always a viable threat of revolution. So we need a program of action. We need to know what we want. We need to know what the reforms could look like but we must build people's power so that those elites in power, that small group of 400 MPs, know that there are millions of people who can take them out of those seats in a minute. They must know that we have power. They must know that we can upend this thing if they decide that they don't want to do us. That's democracy too. Revolution is not incompatible with democracy. In fact, a form of democracy is for people to exercise their power. But we must have a reform agenda that is backed up with a viable threat of revolution.
And we must back that revolution up with our time, our thoughts, our ideas, and our resources. But let's be a bit more practical going into the 2024 election. What I want us to keep in mind is the idea that in the 2024 election, we are not necessarily going to change everything about government and who wins and who loses. That's not what I'm asking for. But in 2024, I fear that if we don't see the vote do something that shifts the ground politically, that we're just going to retreat from the democratic project. And so even if you don't know which party should win, even if you're not willing to put your head on a block about a party you're willing to support or a politician you're willing to support, the ultimate goal for the 2024 elections is that the voter must win this election. What the voter wants, what the voter needs, what voters aspire for, that's what must come out of this election, regardless of which politician wins. And so let's create a program of action that gets the voter to win, the voter to feel empowered, and the voter to feel like the change is dependent on us. Elections are not about politicians. They're about voters. If we learn that lesson going into 2024, I think that we will gain so much in terms of our political power as a country and in terms of the quality of our democracy, because I don't think that we'll retreat ever again. Thank you for spending the time. Spread the fire. Aye, yeah, yeah.